The Houston Chronicle is the largest daily newspaper in Houston, Texas, United States. As of April 2016, it is the third largest newspaper by Sunday circulation in the United States, behind only the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times. With its 1995 buy out of longtime rival the Houston Post, the Chronicle became Houston's newspaper of record. The Houston Chronicle is the largest daily paper owned and operated by the Hearst Corporation, a privately held multinational corporate media conglomerate with $10 billion in revenues. The paper employs nearly 2,000 people, including approximately 300 journalists, editors, and photographers. The Chronicle has bureaus in Washington, D.C. and Austin. It reports that its website averages 125 million page views per month. The publication serves as the newspaper of record of the Houston area. Previously headquartered in the Houston Chronicle building at 801 Texas Avenue, downtown Houston, the Houston Chronicle is now located at 4747 Southwest Freeway. It has two websites, cron.com and houstonchronicle.com. Cron.com is free and has breaking news, weather, traffic, pop culture, events listings, and city guides. HoustonChronicle.com, launched in 2012 and accessible after subscription purchase, contains analysis, reporting, columns, and everything found in the daily newspaper. Topic. History From its inception, the practices and policies of the Houston Chronicle were shaped by strong-willed personalities who were the publishers. The history of the newspaper can be best understood when divided into the eras of these individuals. Topic. 1901-1926, Marcellus E. Foster era The Houston Chronicle was founded in 1901 by a former reporter for the now-defunct Houston Post, Marcellus E. Foster. Foster, who had been covering the Spindletop oil boom for the Post, invested in Spindletop and took $30 of the return on that investment—at the time equivalent to a week's wages—and used it to fund the Chronicle. The Chronicle's first edition was published on October 14, 1901 and sold for two cents per copy, at a time when most papers sold for five cents each. At the end of its first month in operation, the Chronicle had a circulation of 4,378, roughly one-tenth of the population of Houston at the time. Within the first year of operation, the paper purchased and consolidated the Daily Herald. In 1908, Foster asked Jesse H. Jones, a local businessman and prominent builder, to construct a new office and plant for the paper, and offered a half interest in the newspaper as a down payment, with 20 years to pay the remainder. Jones agreed, and the resulting Chronicle building was one of the finest in the South. Under Foster, the paper's circulation grew from about 7,000 in 1901 to 75,000 on weekdays and 85,000 on Sundays by 1926. Foster continued to write columns under the pen name MIFO, and drew much attention in the 1920s for his opposition to the Ku Klux Klan KKK. He sold the rest of his interest to Jesse H. Jones on June 26, 1926 and promptly retired. Topic. Goodfellows In 1911, city editor George Keppel started Goodfellows. On a Christmas Eve in 1911, Keppel passed a hat among the Chronicle's reporters to collect money to buy toys for a shoeshine boy. Goodfellows continues today through donations made by the newspaper and its readers. It has grown into a citywide program that provides needy children between the ages of 2 and 10 with toys during the winter holidays. In 2003, Goodfellows distributed almost 250,000 toys to more than 100,000 needy children in the greater Houston area. Topic: 
Topic: 1926 to 1956, Jesse H. Jones era. In 1926, Jesse H. Jones became the sole owner of the paper. He had approached Foster about selling, and Foster had answered, What will you give me? Jones described the buyout of Foster as follows Wanting to be liberal with Foster if I bought him out, since he had created the paper and originally owned most of the stock, and had made a success of it, I thought for a while before answering and finally asked him how much he owed. He replied, on real estate and everything about $200,000, I then said to him that I would give him $300,000 in cash, having in mind that this would pay his debts and give him $100,000 spending money. In addition, I would give him a note for $500,000 secured by a mortgage on the Chronicle building, the note to be payable interest and principal at the rate of $35,000 a year for 35 years, which I figured was about his expectancy. I would also pay him $20,000 a year as editor of the paper and $6,000 a year to continue writing the daily front page column, MIFO, on the condition that either of us could cancel the editorship and or the MIFO column contracts on six months' notice, and that, if I cancelled both the column and the editorship, I would give him an additional $6,000 a year for life. I considered the offer substantially more than the Chronicle was worth at the time. No sooner had I finished stating my proposition than he said, I will take it, and the transaction was completed accordingly. In 1937, Jesse H. Jones transferred ownership of the paper to the newly established Houston Endowment Inc. Jones retained the title of publisher until his death in 1956. According to the Handbook of Texas Online, the Chronicle generally represented very conservative political views during the 1950s. The Chronicle generally represented the very conservative political interests of the Houston business establishment. As such, it eschewed controversial political topics, such as integration or the impacts of rapid economic growth on life in the city. It did not perform investigative journalism. This resulted in a stodgy newspaper that failed to capture the interests of newcomers to the city. By 1959, circulation of the rival Houston Post had pulled ahead of the Chronicle. Jones, a lifelong Democrat who organized the Democratic National Convention to be in Houston in 1928, and who spent long years in public service first under the Wilson administration, helping to found the Red Cross during World War I, and later famously under the Roosevelt administration, described the paper's mission in these terms. I regard the publication of a newspaper as a distinct public trust, and one not to be treated lightly or abused for selfish purposes or to gratify selfish whims. A great daily newspaper can remain a power for good only so long as it is uninfluenced by unworthy motives, and unbought by the desire for gain. A newspaper which can be neither bought nor bullied is the greatest asset of a city or state. Naturally, a newspaper makes mistakes in judgment, as it does in type, but, so long as errors are honestly made, they are not serious when general results are considered. The success or failure of a particular issue is of little consequence compared with the all important principle of a fearless and honest newspaper. This I intend the Chronicle shall always be, a newspaper for all the people, democratic in fact and in principle, standing for the greatest good to the greatest number, championing and defending what it believes to be right, and condemning and opposing what it believes to be wrong, such have always been the policies of the Chronicle and to such it is now rededicated. Under Jones' watch, the Chronicle bought KTRH, one of Houston's oldest radio stations, in 1937. In 1954, Jones led a syndicate that signed on Houston's third television station, KTRK-TV. Topic: 1956 to 1965, John T. Jones era. The board of Houston Endowment named John T. Jones, nephew of Jesse H. Jones, as editor of the Chronicle. 
Houston Endowment President, J. Howard Creekmore, was named publisher. In 1961, John T. Jones hired William P. Stephen as editor. Stephen had previously been editor of the Tulsa Tribune and the Minneapolis Star Tribune, and credited with turning around the declining readership of both papers. One of his innovations was the creation of a regular help column called, Watch em where ordinary citizens could voice their complaints. The Chicago Tribune later called this column a pioneer and prototype of the modern newspaper, Action Line. Stevens' progressive political philosophy soon created conflict with the very conservative views of the Houston Endowment Board, especially when he editorially supported the election of Lyndon B. Johnson, the Democratic candidate for president. But more than political philosophy was involved, Robert A. Caro revealed in his biography of Johnson that written assurance of this support from John T. Jones had been the price demanded by Johnson in January 1964 in return for approval of the merger of Houston's National Bank of Commerce, in which Jones had a financial interest, with another Houston bank, the Texas National. In 1964, the Chronicle purchased the assets of its evening newspaper competitor, the Houston press, becoming the only evening newspaper in the city. By then, the Chronicle had a circulation of 254,000 the largest of any paper in Texas. The Atlantic Monthly credited the growth to the changes instigated by Stephen. In the summer of 1965, Jones decided to buy a local television station that was already owned by the Houston Endowment. He resigned from the Houston Endowment Board to avoid a conflict of interest, though he remained as publisher of the Chronicle. On September 2, 1965, Jones made a late-night visit to the Stephen home, where he broke the news that the Endowment Board had ordered him to dismiss Stephen. Jones had to comply. On September 3, the paper published a story announcing that Everett Collier was now the new editor. No mention was made of Stephen or the Houston Endowment Board. Houston Post staff wrote an article about the change, but top management killed it. Only two weekly papers in Houston mentioned it, Forward Times, which targeted the African-American community, and the Houston Tribune, an ultra-conservative paper. Both papers had rather small circulations and no influence among the city's business community. The two major newspapers in Houston never mentioned Stephen for many years thereafter. Topic. 1965–1987, J. Howard Creekmore era John J. Jones left the Chronicle not long after Stephen's ouster. J. Howard Creekmore, president of the Houston Endowment, took John Jones' place at the Chronicle. Everett D. Collier replaced Stephen as editor. Collier remained in this position until his retirement in 1979. J. Howard Creekmore was born in Abilene, Texas in 1905. His parents died while he was young, so he was raised by his stepmother. The family moved to Houston in 1920. Howard enrolled in Rice Institute, where he graduated with degrees in history and English. After graduation, he went to work for Jesse Jones as a bookkeeper. Jones took an interest in the young man's career, and put him through law school. Creekmore passed the bar exam in 1932 and returned to work for Jones. He held several positions in the Jones business empire. In 1959, he was named to the board of Houston Endowment, and was promoted to president of the board in 1964. By 1965, Creekmore had persuaded other directors of Houston Endowment to sell several business properties, including the Chronicle. Houston oilman John Mecom offered $85 million for the newspaper, its building, a 30% interest in Texas National Bank of Commerce and the historic Rice Hotel. Early in 1966, Mecom encountered problems raising the additional cash to complete the transaction. He then began lining up potential buyers for the newspaper, which included non-Houstonians such as Sam Newhouse, Otis Chandler and the Scripps Howard organization. Creekmore strongly believed that local persons should own the paper. 
He insisted that MECOM pay the $84 million debt immediately in cash. MECOM cancelled his purchase agreement. In 1968, the Chronicle set a Texas newspaper circulation record. In 1981, the business pages which up until then had been combined with sports became its own section of the newspaper. Creekmore remained as publisher until Houston Endowment sold the paper to the Hearst Corporation. Topic. 1987–present, Hearst Corporation era On May 1, 1987, the Hearst Corporation purchased the Houston Chronicle from Houston Endowment for $415 million. Richard J. V. Johnson, who had joined the paper as a copy editor in 1956, and worked up to executive vice president in 1972, and president in 1973, remained as chairman and publisher until he retired April 1, 2002. He was succeeded by Jack Sweeney. In 1994, the Chronicle switched to being a morning-only paper. With the demise of the Houston Post on April 18 the next year, the Chronicle became Houston's sole major daily newspaper. On October 18, 2008, the paper endorsed Senator Barack Obama for President of the United States in the 2008 U.S. presidential election, the first Democrat to be endorsed by the newspaper since 1964, when it endorsed Texan Lyndon B. Johnson. It endorsed Mitt Romney in 2012, but endorsed Hillary Clinton in 2016. Locally, the Chronicle endorsed Wendy Davis for governor in 2014, and Sylvester Turner for mayor in 2015. Additionally, the Chronicle initially endorsed Jeb Bush for the 2016 Republican primary, but did not endorse any other candidate after he dropped out. Topic. Headquarters Topic forty seven forty seven Southwest Freeway On July 21, 2014 the Chronicle announced that its downtown employees were moving to the 610 Loop campus, at the intersection of the 610 Loop and U.S. Route 59, I-69 Southwest Freeway. The facility, previously used as the Houston Post headquarters, will have a total of seven buildings with a total of over 440,000 square feet 41,000 square meters of space. The original building is a 1970s four-story, new brutalist, building. As of 2016 the building housed the Chronicle Production Department, as well as the offices of the Spanish newspaper La Voz de Houston. Topic. 801 Texas The Houston Chronicle building in downtown Houston was the headquarters of the Houston Chronicle. The facility included a loading dock, office space, a press room, and production areas. It had 10 stories above ground and 3 stories below ground. The printing presses used by the newspaper spanned 3 stories. The presses were 2 stories below ground and 1 above. In the downtown facility, the presses there were decommissioned in the late 2000s. The newsroom within the facility had bullpen-style offices with a few private cubicles and offices on the edges. The facility was connected to the downtown Houston tunnel system. Turner wrote that, in recent decades, 801 Texas, offered viewers an architectural visage of unadorned boxiness, and that, an accretion of five buildings made into one, it featured a maze of corridors, cul-de-sacs and steps that seemed to spring on strollers at the most unexpected times. The facility, 106 years old as of 2016, was originally four separate structures that were joined together to make one building. Jesse H. Jones erected the first Chronicle building, a narrow and long structure clad in granite, on the corner of Travis Street and Texas Avenue in 1910. The second building, the Majestic Theater, was built west of the Chronicle building. 
The second building built by Jones, it opened in 1910. In 1918 the third Jones Building, Milam Building, opened west of the theatre. An annex was built on the north side of the main building in 1938, and that annex gained a fifth floor in the 1960s. The fifth building was a production plant built north of the original four buildings. They were joined together in a major renovation and modernization project completed in the late 1960s. On April 25, 2017, it was imploded and reduced to rubble. Today, a parking lot now occupies the former site. Topic People Jack Sweeney is the publisher of the Houston Chronicle and chairman of the executive team, John McKeon is the president of the newspaper. As of August 2015, the executive team includes, President, John McKeon Executive Vice President and Editor, Nancy Barnes Executive Editor, Opinions, and Editorials, Jeff Cohen Chief Operating Officer, John McKeon Executive Vice Presidents, Sales, Mike Labonia Digital Revenue Development and B2B Marketing, Stephen Weiss Vice Presidents, Consumer Sales and Marketing, Michael Gorman Regional Advertising, Jeff Lawrence Multi Market, Market, strategic and National Sales, Dan Brennan Audience Development and Planning, Linda Shabletha Paper employs nearly 2,000 people, including approximately 300 journalists and bloggers. In addition, the Chronicle contracts with multiple distributors who circulate and deliver copies of the newspaper. John H. Murphy was a longtime Chronicle officer. He was the assistant to Richard Johnson, a former executive vice president of the Texas Daily Newspaper Association, and a newspaperman, mostly in Houston, for 74 years. <laughs> Topic. Awards 2000, Houston's M.D. Anderson Cancer Center gave the Chronicle its Joseph T. Ainsworth Volunteer Community Award for making the newspaper available at a greatly reduced rate to the hospital and its patients. 2002, Holocaust Museum Houston awarded the Chronicle its Guardian of the Human Spirit Award. The presenter, Janice Goldstein, said the award was given because the Houston Chronicle embraces the causes most dear to it with a depth and scope that goes well beyond what is expected. Also, that the Chronicle gives of itself to build a community that will embrace tolerance, understanding, and diversity and will speak out against prejudice and unfairness of any kind. Topic. Individual awards. 1963, William Porterfield won an Ernie Pyle Award. 1989-1997, Carlos Antonio Rios, a Chronicle photographer since 1978, has repeatedly been honored for his photojournalism by the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. 2003, James Howard Gibbons received third place in the Hearst Distinguished Journalism Awards an internal contest held between Hearst's newspapers, for his editorial piece When Will the U.S. Liberate Texas? 2005, then White House correspondent Julie Mason was voted by readers of Wonket a Washington, D.C. political blog the tongue-in-cheek, best to sit next to on the bus for more than 20 minutes. Mason later left the newspaper for the Washington Examiner. She now hosts the press pool on the POTUS channel on Sirius XM. Leon Hale, a longtime columnist and author of 11 books, recently received the Lon Tinkle Award for Excellence sustained throughout a career from the Texas Institute of Letters, of which Hale is member. Jason Whitmer won first place in the 48-hour web category of the National Press Photographers Association's annual Best of Photojournalism in 2010 for his piece, Too Manly for Quilt Show. Whitmer won second place in the news feature web category for Suddenly Homeless in Houston. Topic. Pulitzer Prize 2015, Pulitzer Prize for Commentary. Lisa Falkenberg. 2015 winner for Commentary.
for vividly written, groundbreaking columns about grand jury abuses that led to a wrongful conviction and uncovered other egregious problems in the legal and immigration systems. The newspaper and its staff have several times been Pulitzer finalists. Dudley Althaus 1992 finalist in international reporting for his articles on the causes of the cholera epidemic in Peru and Mexico. Tony Fremantle 1997 finalist in international reporting for his reporting from Rwanda, South Africa, El Salvador and Guatemala on why crimes against humanity go unstopped and unpunished. Nick Anderson 2007 finalist for editorial cartooning for his pungent cartoons on an array of issues, and for his bold use of animation. Anderson won the Pulitzer in 2005 when working for the Courier Journal, Louisville, Kentucky. Staff 2009 finalist for breaking news coverage. For taking full advantage of online technology and its newsroom expertise to become a lifeline to the city when Hurricane Ike struck, providing vital minute-by-minute -minute updates on the storm, its flood surge and its aftermath. Staff 2017 finalist for public service. For exposing the grave injustice of arbitrary cost-cutting by the state of Texas that denied tutoring, counseling and other vital special education services to families, hindering the futures of tens of thousands of children. Joe Hawley and Evan Mintz. 2017 finalist for editorial writing. For editorials on gun laws, gun culture and gun tragedies that combined wit, eloquence and moral power in a fine brew of common sense argumentation. Staff 2018 finalist for breaking news. For comprehensive and dynamic coverage of Hurricane Harvey that captured real-time developments of the unprecedented scale of the disaster and provided crucial information to its community during the storm and its aftermath. Topic. Other notable people Fernando Dovalina Jr. Former assistant managing editor Maxine Mezinger Gossip columnist Leon Hale Columnist Richard Justice Sports writer Heidi Van Horn Automotive columnist Sonny Nash Contributor, columnist, photographer Marjorie Paxson, influential women's page editor. Topic: 2018 investigation of source fabrication. In September 2018, then executive editor Nancy Barnes released a statement on the Chronicle's website notifying readers for the first time that the paper's Austin bureau chief, Mike Ward, had resigned and was the subject of an internal investigation after questions were raised by a staff member over fabricating sources. At the time, Barnes said in her statement, As a journalism organization, we owe the public more. We owe our readers the truth and to tell you if, in fact, there were inaccuracies in anything we published. We simply do not know the full story yet. The sources being questioned in Ward's reporting were the product of Man on the Street interviews from a story dealing with rebuilding efforts following Hurricane Harvey. Barnes said Houston Chronicle researchers had problems finding a number of sources quoted in Ward's story, so the newspaper hired investigative journalist David Wood, a Pulitzer Prize winner, to look into the situation. On November 8, 2018, one day before Barnes left for a position as senior vice president of news at National Public Radio, the Houston Chronicle released some of Wood's findings. The paper announced it was retracting a total of eight stories in print and online written by Ward and that it could not confirm up to 122 sources quoted in stories were real people. A more complete snapshot below of what Wood found when he investigated Ward's reporting below. The review included 744 stories, from early August 2018 back to January 2014, when he was hired after a long career at the Austin American Statesman. 
A team of three pulled out the names of 275 individuals who were presented as ordinary Texans and made every effort to find them. Of the 275 people quoted, 122, or 44%, could not be found. Those 122 people appeared in 72 stories. Barnes later went on to tell Columbia Journalism Review that the widespread fabrication apparent in Ward's articles was unprecedented, in her experience. I've been an editor a long time and I have never seen anything like this, period. The Austin American Statesman, where Ward worked as a reporter for 25 years covering the state's political class prior to joining the Houston Chronicle in 2014, also conducted an internal review of his final years of work at the paper after the initial allegations became public in September. Ward provided his former paper a statement, saying, I stand by my stories as published in the Houston Chronicle, he said. Every one of the people I quoted exist. Most, if not all, of these stories were from so-called man-on-the-street interviews not conducted at people's homes, and I correctly quoted the people by the names they gave me. The body of my work over my career over more than four decades speaks for itself, stories that among other things have resulted in indictments and resignations of public officials, brought about sweeping reforms to correct wrongdoing and wasteful spending, stopped pollution that sickened Texans and has delighted secrecy and abuse. In the aftermath, three veteran editors at the Houston Chronicle who were responsible for editing Ward's copy quickly distanced themselves from any responsibility involved in making sure one of their reporters was being honest to readers, including former managing editor Vernon Loeb. Loeb, who worked directly with Ward on a near-daily basis to frame, edit, discuss sources and even rewrite stories, said. I don't believe Mike Ward was the kind of journalist who would make people up. The Houston Chronicle did not publicly announce whether it was taking internal measures to address a newsroom culture that led to a major breach of trust with its readers. Ward, a veteran and award-winning journalist, was the first reporter hired by Barnes & Loeb to work in the combined Hearst newspaper's Austin Bureau, which includes the Houston Chronicle and San Antonio Express News. As such, he was of the paper's top political writers, appearing on television and on radio representing the newspaper, co-hosting a weekly podcast and managing several Chronicle reporters in the Bureau. At the time, the Hearst Austin Bureau had historically maintained only one bureau chief in Austin, but Barnes & Loeb installed Ward as a second bureau chief, helping create a culture of division and internal competition between the two newspapers that permeated Hearst's Austin operation. The Houston Chronicle almost got scooped on the news about one of its own faking sources, a potential PR nightmare for a news organization. Barnes did not disclose to the public that the paper was looking into one of its own over allegations of creating fake sources until the situation had already become well-known gossip in Austin circles around the state capitol, including among staffers and competing media publications, and only after fielding an inquiry from at least one reporter working on a story about the situation. Shortly after getting a call from a freelance reporter, Barnes issued a statement addressing the sudden resignation and investigation of the paper's Austin bureau chief. A copy of the original story that led to the investigation has been removed from the Chronicle's website. But Austin-based NPR affiliate Cut interviewed Ward for the radio in the days after the story ran. Ward was quoted on air responding to questions, and the radio station published a short piece online summarizing Ward's finding from his now retracted story. That story is still on KUT's website. <laughs> Topic. Sections The Houston Chronicle is divided into several sections. Front page A. City and State B B Sports C Business D Star Lifestyle and Entertainment E The Local 
Sections are no longer published on Thursdays. Topic: Robert Jensen series on the September 11, 2001 attacks on the US. In the weeks following the September 11, 2001 attacks the Houston Chronicle published a series of opinion articles by University of Texas journalism professor Robert Jensen that asserted the United States was just as guilty as the hijackers in committing acts of violence and compared that attack with the history of U.S. attacks on civilians in other countries. The opinion piece resulted in hundreds of angry letters to the editor and reportedly over 4,000 angry responses to Jensen, among them were claims of insensitivity against the newspaper and of giving an unduly large audience to a position characterized as being extremist. University of Texas President Larry Faulkner issued a response denouncing Jensen's as a fountain of undiluted foolishness on issues of public policy, noting H.E. is not speaking in the university's name and may not speak in its name. The Chronicle printed four subsequent opinion articles by Jensen, asserting his case. Jensen is also a regular guest writer on the opinion page and has published several dozen opinion articles on other subjects in the Chronicle. Topic: Other publications. In April 2004 the Houston Chronicle began carrying a Spanish-language supplement, the entertainment magazine La Vibra. La Vibra caters to speakers of Spanish and bilingual English-Spanish speakers, and is mainly distributed in Hispanic neighborhoods. In December 2004 the Chronicle acquired the Spanish-language newspaper La Voz de Houston. Topic. Criticism Topic. Light rail controversy In late 2002, Chronicle website managers accidentally posted an internal memorandum on its website. The memorandum outlined a draft agenda of coordinated news articles, editorials, and op-eds seemingly intended to promote a referendum to expand Houston's controversial Metrorail system on the 2003 ballot. It proposed several investigative news stories and editorials designed to examine the campaign led by Tom DeLay and Bob Lanier to defeat rail expansion. DeLay, a Houston congressman, and Lanier, a former mayor of Houston, had both actively opposed light rail in the past. The document was online for only an hour, but long enough to be viewed by some readers. Soon after, the Houston Review, a conservative newspaper published by students at the University of Houston, printed the memo's full text and an accompanying commentary that criticized the paper. The Chronicle's response was initially muted. Its first official response appeared in the Corrections section later the same week stating, An internal Houston Chronicle document was mistakenly posted to the editorial, opinion area of the website early Thursday morning. We apologize for any confusion it may have caused. Chronicle editor Jeff Cohen, who gave a statement in defense of the memorandum, I make no apologies for having a thorough discussion of the issue. We have nothing to apologize for, there was an inadvertent posting of it to the website, and I'm sorry about that, but I make no apologies for the contents of it. As the bond referendum approached, the Houston Chronicle requested that Texans for True Mobility TTM, the main critic of Metrorail, provide the paper with a copy of their financial contributor reports. TTM declined, saying they did not believe the Chronicle would adequately protect the privacy of their donors. The Chronicle responded by making a complaint to the Harris County District Attorney's Office asking that Texans for True Mobility be investigated for potential violations of Texas election law. The Chronicle alleged that TTM broke a law requiring PACs to disclose their donors. 
TTM said that their status as a registered nonprofit 501 C 6 organization, as opposed to a PAC, did not require them to do so. The Chronicle argued that the law covered TTM because it made paid political moves. Texas campaign law allows nonprofits to run educational advertisements, but those advertisements cannot endorse specific political positions or people or make a specific recommendation in a pending election. The dispute was over whether TTM's advertisements, and specifically the slogans, Metro's rail plan costs too much, does too little, and Metro's plan won't work here, were specific recommendations on how to vote. Harris County District Attorney Rosenthal later dismissed the Chronicle's complaint, finding it without merit on the grounds that the statute did not apply. Rosenthal's involvement in the probe itself came under fire by the Houston Press, which in editorials questioned whether Rosenthal was too close to TTM. From 2000 to 2004, Rosenthal accepted some $30,000 in donations from known TTM supporters. Later that year, TTM revealed that their television and radio ads were funded by $30,000 in contributions made the day before the election by two PACs controlled by delay. Topic. Sandoval family interview In early 2004, Chronicle reporter Lucas Wall interviewed the family of Leroy Sandoval, a Marine from Houston who was killed in Iraq. After the article appeared, Sandoval's stepfather and sister called into Houston talk radio station KSEV and said that a sentence alleging, President Bush's failure to find weapons of mass destruction in Iraq misrepresented their views on the war and President George W. Bush, that Wall had pressured them for a quotation that criticized Bush, and that the line alleging Bush's failure was included against the wishes of the family. A dispute ensued between KSEV radio show host, owner Dan Patrick and an assistant managing editor at the Chronicle. The incident prompted Patrick to join the call for a boycott of the paper. The story was also picked up by the local Houston television stations and, a week later, The O'Reilly Factor. Eventually, Chronicle publisher Jack Sweeney contacted the Sandoval family to apologize. Topic. Purchase of Houston Post assets On April 18, 1995, the Houston Post ceased operations, leaving the Chronicle as Houston's only major daily newspaper, and the Hearst Corporation purchased some of the Post's assets. Houston Chronicle announced it in a way that suggested the shutdown and Hearst's purchase of the Post's assets were simultaneous events. Post closes, Hearst buys assets. The Chronicle headline read the day after the Post was shut. Internal memos obtained via FOIA from the Justice Department antitrust attorneys who investigated the closing of the Houston Post said the Chronicle's parent organization struck a deal to buy the Post six months before it closed. The memos, first obtained by the alternative paper The Houston Press, say the Chronicle's conglomerate and the Post reached an agreement in October, 1994, for the sale of Houston Post Co.'s assets for approximately $120 million. Topic. Tom DeLay Poll In January 2006 the Chronicle hired Richard Murray of the University of Houston to conduct an election survey in the district of U.S. Representative Tom DeLay, in light of his 2005 indictment by District Attorney Ronnie Earle for alleged campaign money violations. The Chronicle said that its poll showed, "...severely eroded support for U.S. Rep. Tom DeLay in his district, most notably among Republicans who have voted for him before." Former Texas Secretary of State Jack Raines contacted the Chronicle's James Howard Gibbons, alleging that the poll appeared to incorrectly count non-Republican primary voters in its sample. 
Reigns also asserted that Murray had a conflict of interest in the poll, as Murray's son Keir was a political consultant working for Nick Lampson, Delay's Democratic challenger in 2006. In response, Gibbons denied the methodological flaws in the poll. Topic. Availability of Houston Post articles Some Houston Post articles had been made available in the archives of the Houston Chronicle website, but by 2005 they were removed. The Houston Chronicle online editor Mike Reed said that the Houston Chronicle decided to remove Houston Post articles from the website after the 2001 United States Supreme Court, New York Times Co. v. Tassini decision. The newspaper originally planned to filter articles not allowed by the decision and to post articles that were not prohibited by the decision. The Houston Chronicle decided not to post or repost any more Houston Post articles because of difficulties in complying with the New York Times Co. v. Tassini decision with the resources that were available to the newspaper. People interested in reading Houston Post articles may view them on microfilm. The Houston Public Library has the newspaper on microfilm from 1880 to 1995 and the Houston Post Index from 1976 to 1994. The 1880 to 1900 microfilm is in the Texas and Local History Department of the Julia Ideson Building, while 1900 to 1995 is in the Jesse H. Jones Building, the main building of the Central Library. In addition, the M.D. Anderson Library at the University of Houston has the Houston Post available on microfilm from 1880 to 1995, and the Houston Post Index from 1976 to 1979 and from 1987 to 1994. Topic. See also Houston Post Houston Press